Hello everyone and welcome back to another Math Monday. On Mondays I try to review books in the general field of mathematics and it is Monday so let's talk math. Today I'm going to be re reviewing a book that kind of falls into this intersection between math and art which is a really interesting intersection. I actually reviewed another book recently called Mathematical Impressions by Fomenko which was another book in the intersection between mathematics and art that was by a Russian or previously Soviet topologist and that was a really interesting book and so I was looking forward to reading and reviewing math art. I'm trying to get my head on the other side of the book. Math Art, Truth, Beauty, and Equations by Stephen Orns. So we have this ball on the cover. It's actually raised a little bit so you can feel it. This is what the book looks like, the back, and let's talk. So math art is indeed this intersection between artists and mathematicians or mathematics, and it's artists whose art is incorporating different things intentionally from the field of mathematics. The book is set up so each artist has a section where they talk about the artist. We, they show off a little bit of his or her works through some pages. And then at the end of the artist's section, they have a section called the math behind the art where they go, go more into the actual mathematical concepts that the artist is trying to incorporate in his or her works. So it does give you a wide overview of a wide variety of artists working in different mediums. And I think it's a really, really good overview. And if you want to go any further into any one of these artists, you can take your time to dive in further. There's a lot of websites that are mentioned and all these people I'm sure you could look up online and find more information or their portfolios online, but they really do give you a very interesting overview of people who are working in a wide variety of subjects. Plenty of pictures and plenty of math to accompany it in these math behind the art sections. I do think it's a good entry point for anyone who's not entirely sure if they want to read a book all on math because there's that um, visual aspect, that artistic aspect that maybe makes it more appealing and that's why I think this book is a really good intersection between those two fields. There were a couple artists or pieces that stood out that I wanted to address. The first was a piece that actually reminded me of that Mathematical Impressions book by Fomenko that I mentioned before. And that was actually in this first section called The Art of Pi where there was these quilts that were designed to represent Pi. And so this artist who, let me make sure I get his name, um, John Sims. Each one of the colors here represents a different number and they're using this to represent the many digits of pi. But there's many different ways to represent numbers. Um, so they can do things in, for example, binary. So there's different ways of representing pi that he has put into these quilts by working with this Amish and Mennonite community down in Florida. This in particular, these pie quilts, really reminds me of this piece of work in that Mathematical Impressions book that I read, where the artist, he didn't use color to, F Fomenko in the other books didn't use color to represent the digits, but he actually used the number of dots in like a square to represent the digits. So a little bit more straightforward, a little bit less abstract in that form. And he had them on these cubes, which is really, really interesting. And I just saw a little connection there between the work of John Sims and the work of Fomenko in that other book the cats are making noise. <laughs> the other artist, which I actually had heard of before, but I think does a really good job in the work that she does, is um, Dinah Tamina, I believe is her name. Let me double check. Dinah Tamina, yes. And she is a Latvian mathematician who does crocheting with regard to hyperbolic space. So she does crocheting projects which demonstrate hyperbolic space or hyperbolic geometry. I took a non-Euclidean geometry course when I was in college and it was very, very interesting to think about the general rules of geometry that we're all taught in like high school and maybe our early years of college if we do take some mathematical courses in college and think about how those rules may or may not apply when we get into spaces that don't work exactly like a flat plane. For example, how do those rules apply when we're working on the surface of a sphere? And one of the hardest ones, we learned about different types of geometries, other different non-Euclidean geometries in my course, but hyperbolic geometry was the one that was more difficult for me to understand what was going on. And I had not heard of Dinah Tamina, I just struggled along with the course and I wound up getting a perfectly good grade, but I did find that hyperbolic geometry section to be the most difficult to um, kind of visualize in my head at first, I have to say. And I love this section in the book that the author includes, which is 
Um, while studying math at the University of Latvia, she had to take a class on a subject called hyperbolic geometry and it confused her. And immediately I was like, I, I can relate. Her teacher drew lines on a flat chalkboard and explained something weird about parallel lines. She didn't get it. I disliked it, she told me, although she passed the class, I truly believed I would never have to think about hyperbolic geometry again. Basically, she was then forced to teach the subject or she got into a position where she had to teach the subject later on in life. And she realized that crocheting was a really unique way of representing and making accessible this more abstract concept that up until then, up until then, no one had really, no one had really done this crocheting to show this hyperbolic space before. She does credit another artist who she met who, um, David Henderson, who was doing something similar but with paper, but she really found it to work with crocheting, which I feel like is something that maybe you wouldn't associate with mathematics, but I think it's a really interesting and unique idea. And like I said, I wish I had had this idea when, um, or this concept presented to me when I was taking this class because I think it would have made things make a lot more sense in that class. I've heard of her before. She's been in other books that I have read, and I think it was um, the Big Bang of Numbers, if I remember correctly, is the other book or the book, book where I first encountered um, her name and I looked her up and I learned a little bit more about her, but I just think her work is so cool. So I'm glad that she was included in this book. Additionally, I really like this book because it touched on something that I am very passionate about and that is that most people, or let's back up, that's about the reputation that mathematics has. I actually was not like a genius wonder kid at mathematics in high school or middle school or elementary school. I didn't like math until I got to Algebra 2, which I took when I was in 10th grade. I just had a teacher who clicked with me. And I think a big part of math education is that it's not presented in an interesting way. And it's, we are lacking a lot of good, talented teachers who have a passion for the subject. And a big reason why that, at least for that, at least in my personal opinion, is if I get a math degree, I can make more money doing anything else but teaching. But that's a whole different topic about teachers and teacher salaries that I don't want to get into. But I do think that math has like a reputation problem. It's one of those topics where people are allowed to hate passionately and no one really questions it. If you mentioned, oh, I didn't like English class or I didn't like chemistry class, maybe some people would be like, oh, I dislike that class too. But math is like the one subject where you're just allowed to hate for no reason. You're everyone, it's like the socially acceptable thing for everyone to hate and you're seen, it's seen as weird to really like it or enjoy it. You're perceived that you must be a natural genius at it. And by no means was I really, really good at math. I actually had to struggle quite a bit and study quite a bit to get through the math course that I took at college, but it was very enjoyable to me. But the only reason it was enjoyable was because I had a couple good teachers at the tail end of my high school career, which made me even think about signing up for any sort of class doing math in college beyond my needed requirements. If I hadn't had those key teachers at that key point in my life, I don't think I would have set me down this path that ultimately wound up in me getting a degree in mathematics. And this book has a, um, a paragraph which I really related to. It's actually on page 44 if you do wind up getting this book. And it says, many people associate math with grueling multiplication drills and memorized geometry proofs. Students often aren't exposed to the aesthetic, elegant, and wondrous side of the subject until they study math in college. By then it's often too late. Many would-be mathematicians have already chosen another field, which I strongly agree with. Math, to me, got very, very interesting when I was taking Calculus 2. This was the first class I took in college, and I started to just get interested. So then I took some more classes, and the more classes I got, the more, to quote this book, aesthetic, elegant, and wonderful the topic came to me. I feel like the the math that we're presented in high school will maybe very important to building our foundations in mathematics isn't really, in my opinion, the most, again, to quote this book, aesthetic, elegant, and wondrous side of the subject. And you lose a lot of students through that process, the time where things can really truly start to get interesting, which is usually the math classes that you're starting to be presented with in college. Again, most of the students have fallen away from the subject. They think they're bad at it when they really may not be bad at it. They really may not have had a really good teacher in the subject. They haven't had a good experience with mathematics. It's something that's been presented as something you're innately good at or you're innately not good at, and they are definitely innately not good at it. So they can't do mathematics. It's only for the people who are really good. They're not even going to touch a course. They're going to take the bare minimum they need to get through school and then they are conditioned to hate it and then I feel like this cycle perpetuates when those people have children and they almost teach the children to hate the subject for example this author says a few sentences down um the project combines team building with hands-on mathematic lessons his youngest audiences aren't even old enough to know they're not supposed to like math and I feel like not liking math well in a perfect world even if we taught this with great teachers from a very young age 
um, in a wonderful environment that really explored the, explored the full beauty of mathematics, there would be students who still didn't like math, but I think that number would be much lower. And I feel like a lot of students are taught by their parents, their teachers, the classes they're in that math is something boring, something they're never going to use, something that has no bearing in real life, something only people who have a very strong innate talent go into and something they are allowed to and should hate, just do the bare minimum and get through. And that's kind of this cultural narrative we have around mathematics that I think we really need to get away from. But now I've been on my soapbox for a little bit, so I need to set back down and get back to this book, Math, Art, Truth, Beauty, and Equations. This was a wonderful book. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed looking at the math. I enjoyed seeing these artists, especially ones that I've known of before, such as the Dinah Tamina and her hyperbolic space crocheting. I really enjoyed this. I think a lot of other people would enjoy it, whether you're more interested in the math or more interested in the art. It'll give you Something in here will appeal to you. There's something in here for everyone. There's something in here for the artists. There's something in here for the mathematicians. There's something in here for people who don't know what they're looking for. And I think it's up to you to get this book out and decide what you like of it. Please let me know if you've read this book or have anything similar that you would like to recommend. I love to get reviews or rather suggestions from you guys. I like to look into your suggestions. I know I have received a suggestion recently for another Math Monday book, which I do have on hold and is coming. But if you have any suggestions, I would love to hear about them, so put them in the comments below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.